as the Internet Computer Project progresses towards launch, we're going to be releasing in-depth technical materials. But let's start off today with a very high-level view of how the system works. As previously mentioned, the ICP protocol is a blockchain computer protocol. One of the things that makes the protocol unique is that it has an open onboard governance system called the network nervous system. The network nervous system is responsible for controlling, configuring, and managing the network. The internet computer network is constructed from a hierarchy of building blocks. At the bottom, you've got data centers. And you might imagine that in 10 years, there are thousands of data centers in the internet computer network. They host standardized node hardware. And in 10 years, there'll probably be millions of these node machines in the overall network. These node machines are combined to create something called subnets. And you can imagine there might be hundreds of thousands or millions of these subnets. Subnets host canisters, which are the interoperable compute units that are uploaded by users. And there might be billions of these within the network. The network nervous system is responsible, in a sense, for managing the data centers. Data centers get into the network through applying to the network nervous system. So the network nervous system is responsible for inducting data centers. In that sense, while the network nervous system itself is an open governance system, it permissions participation in the network. In a sense, it plays a role equivalent to ICANN on the internet, which, for example, doles out autonomous system numbers for those that want to run BGP routers. The network nervous system actually plays a wide range of network management roles. For example, it monitors the node machines looking for statistical deviation uh, that could indicate underperformance or faulty behavior. The network nervous system also plays a key role in the token economics of the network. Token economics is a broad subject on the internet computer. The network nervous system generates new ICP tokens to reward nodes that are being run by data centers and neurons that are voting within the network nervous system, which is how it decides on proposals that are submitted to it. When the network nervous system creates new ICP tokens to reward data centers and neurons, it's inflationary. If you're wondering, ICP tokens used to be called DFN. Eventually, data center owners and neuron owners take their tokens and exchange them with canister owners and managers. Canister owners and managers take these tokens and convert them into cycles and use those cycles to charge up their canisters. When those canisters perform computations or store memory, for example, they burn their way through the cycles. And eventually, they have to be recharged with more cycles to continue running. That's deflationary. To understand the internet computer, you have to understand the concept of subnets, which are the fundamental building block of the overall network. A subnet is responsible for hosting a distinct subset of the software canisters hosted by the overall internet computer network. The network nervous system combines nodes from independent data centers when constructing subnets. This enables ICP protocol math to ensure subnets are tamper-proof and unstoppable using Byzantine fault-tolerant technology and cryptography developed at Definity. Although subnets are the fundamental building block of the overall internet computer network. They're transparent to users and software. Users and canister software only need to know the identity of a canister to call the functions that it shares. This transparency is an extension of the internet's fundamental design principles. On the internet, if I want to connect to some software, I only need to know the IP address of the machine the software is running on and the port that the software is listening on. On the internet computer, if I wish to call a function, I only need to know the identity of the canister and the function signature. 
in the same way the internet creates seamless connectivity, we have created a seamless universe for software, where any software, given permission, can call any other software directly without knowing anything about the underlying workings of the network. The internet computer also ensures the transparency of subnets in other ways. The network nervous system can split and merge subnets in order to balance load across the overall network. This is also transparent to the hosted canisters. In this example, we've got an imaginary subnet, ABC, which hosts 11 canisters. The network nervous system tells it to split. Subnet ABC continues with canisters 1 through 6. And a new subnet is spawned, XYZ, that continues with canisters 7 through 11. None of the canisters involved will have experienced an interruption in service. When you upload your canisters to the internet computer, you have to target a specific subnet type. There's actually a special subnet that hosts the network nervous system, but you can't upload your canisters to that. Instead, you have to target a subnet type such as data, system, or fiduciary. The subnet type grants your canister certain properties and capabilities. For example, if your canister is hosted on a data subnet, it can process calls, but it can't make calls to other canisters. For that, you'll need a system subnet. If you want your canister to be able to hold balances of ICP tokens or to send cycles to other canisters, you'll need a fiduciary subnet. And for those kinds of reasons, governance canisters can only be hosted on fiduciary subnets too. The capabilities of subnets partly derives from the underlying fault tolerance. This is a really exciting area of the underlying science that I hope to explore in future talks. For example, we've got new cryptography that allows the network nervous system to repair broken subnets. Of course, the purpose of subnets is to host canisters. So let's take a look at how they work too. Canisters run within dedicated hypervisors and interact with each other via a publicly specified API. Inside a canister is WebAssembly bytecode that can run on a WebAssembly virtual machine and the pages of memory that it runs within. Typically, that WebAssembly bytecode will have been created by compiling down a programming language such as Rust or Motoko. That will have incorporated a runtime that makes it easy for the developer to interact with the API. On the internet computer, the functions shared by canisters must be invoked in one of two ways. They can either be invoked as an update call or a query call. The essential difference is that when you invoke a function as an update call, any changes that it makes to data in the canister's memory are persisted. Whereas, if a function is invoked as a query call, any changes that it makes to memory are discarded after it's run. Update calls make persistent changes, and they're also tamper-proof. They're tamper-proof because the ICP blockchain computer protocols run them on every node in the subnet. As you would expect, the calls run within a consistent global ordering of calls using mechanisms that allow for concurrent execution within a fully deterministic execution environment. Update calls complete in just two seconds. In this example, a user submits a buy order to a financial exchange hosted within a canister. Query calls, on the other hand, don't persist changes. Any changes they make to memory are discarded after they run. They are very performant and inexpensive and complete in just a few milliseconds. This is because they don't run on all the nodes in the subnet, which also means they provide a lower level of security. In this example, the user is asking for a custom news feed and gets back freshly generated content almost immediately, providing a great user experience. One of the coolest things about the internet computer is the way that developers persist data. Developers don't think about persistence. They just write their code and persistence happens automatically. It's called orthogonal persistence. 
That's because the internet computer persists the memory pages in which code runs. You might be wondering how all this works. With respect to update calls that can mutate memory pages, canisters are software actors. That means there can only be a single thread of execution inside a canister at any one time. However, by default, update calls can be interleaved. That occurs when update calls make cross-canister update calls which block. This allows the thread of execution to be moved to a new update call. Query calls, by contrast, don't make persistent changes to memory. And this allows there to be any number of concurrent threads processing query calls inside of a canister at any one time. These query calls run against the snapshot of memory recorded in the last finalized state route. Finally, no discussion of canisters would be complete without mentioning that canisters can create new canisters and that canisters can fork themselves. You can create a new canister simply by specifying the WebAssembly bytecode and the memory pages start out empty. When a canister forks itself, a newly spawned copy is created that's identical down to the memory pages inside. Forking proves very powerful when creating scalable internet services. Let's finish up by talking at a high level about internet services that scale out. Canisters have upper bounds on their various types of capacity. For example, a canister can only store four gig of memory pages. For this reason, when we want to create internet services that scale out to billions of users, we have to use multi-canister architectures. We might hope that it's enough to create some special canister, create lots of copies of the canister, and then shard user content to the different canisters in order to create an internet service that can scale out. Unfortunately, this architecture is too simple for a number of reasons. It is true that each additional canister increases the overall memory capacity. It's also true that each additional canister increases the overall update and query call throughput. However, we cannot scale query call requests for a specific user's content. For example, maybe one of the canisters holds Kim Kardashian's data, and there's an awful lot of that that needs to be served. We also need to rebalance user content whenever we increase the capacity of the system by adding more canister shards. And it's not really a great edge architecture, and there's no obvious way to serve query calls to end users from replicas that are in close proximity to them. We're actually going to need both front-end canisters and back-end canisters. The internet computer provides some really cool features for connecting end users to front-end canisters. One of these allows domain names to be mapped to multiple front-end canisters via the network nervous system. When an end user wishes to resolve such a domain name, the internet computer looks at the totality of replica nodes in all the subnets hosting the front-end canisters and returns the IP addresses of the replica nodes in closest proximity. This results in the end user executing query calls on nearby replicas, reducing the inherent network latency and improving the user experience, providing the benefits of edge computing without a content distribution network. To make the best use of this functionality, we need a classic architecture involving front-end canisters and back-end data bucket canisters. In this example, a web browser wishes to load my profile picture. First of all, the web browser will be mapped to a front-end canister that is running on a subnetwork with a nearby node. The web browser will then submit a query call request to retrieve the photograph to that nearby node. Front-end canister will then make a cross-canister query call request to the data bucket canister that holds the photograph. Of course, the data buckets will be managed using a standard library class such as BigMap. It's very easy for the developer. If the query call response returned by the data bucket canister involves static content such as a photograph, then it can mark it as cacheable. In such cases, the replica node that's running the front-end canister's query call can enter the query call response into its query cache. Of course, 
the query call caching mechanism is completely transparent to the front-end canister code. Once the front-end canister that the user called has collected all necessary information, it can return the content either through a query call response or through an HTTP endpoint. Over time, the query caches of nodes accumulate static content and generated data that is of interest to nearby users, providing them with a faster, better user experience. In this way, the native edge architecture of the internet computer provides the benefits of a content distribution network, but without developers having to do anything special and without the need to enlist the help of a separate proprietary service. For update calls, the classic architecture takes a different approach. It's necessary to serialize updates to a user's content and data to prevent problems like lost updates. Typically, this is achieved by mapping a user to a specific front-end canister just by hashing their username, for example. Once a user experience running in a web browser or on a smartphone, say, has determined which front-end canister is responsible for coordinating changes to some content or data, it can modify that content or data by submitting an update call to its standard interface. This front-end canister then typically makes more cross-canister update calls to affect the changes needed. Okay, to wrap this all up, let's think about designing an open internet service using our two-level architecture with front-end canisters and back-end data bucket canisters. First of all, when you write your front-end canister code, you're gonna make your life easy by using an existing library class called BigMap. BigMap can store exabytes of data and you can write objects to it using just one line of code. This architecture will transparently and dynamically scale out. By having front-end canisters and data bucket canisters fork to divide responsibility for objects assigned to one canister between two canisters. Finally, to create a true open internet service, you'll assign responsibility for all your canisters to an open tokenized governance canister. If you're an entrepreneur, you will raise funds for development by selling some of those governance tokens in the early days. And you'll probably design schemes that incentivize early participants in your internet service by giving them governance tokens to get better network effects and win. Thank you.